and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. So tonight we have a production designer. His name is Vincent Reynolds. Welcome to the show, Vincent. I'm so happy that you were able to make the time tonight to uh, talk about what you do. How are you doing tonight? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. First of all, let's just start out with how did you get started in the business? I come from the uh, field of uh, interior design and it was always a dream of mine to be in, you know, call it the, the Hollywood mystic world that, you know, you grew up kind of idolizing. So I always looked at it and then one day I had an opportunity from a friend of mine to break in and I jumped with two feet in. So what was your, what was your first show? Well, I started initially, actually, a friend of mine was a sculptor and an artist and he had introduced me to his company that was building the set for commercials and music videos. And I started to work for the set company. Uh, First as a carpenter builder, but I kind of was not very good at it. But I was very well organized, and I've always, always, you know, able to kind of envision and take a task and dissect it and make it happen. So I started to lead some jobs and being in charge of supervising all the installation and make sure everything was done properly. And through that, I met a lot of different art directors and production designers. And every time I was meeting one of them. I was upselling myself and telling them that I could be a great assistant and, you know, for them to hire me. And eventually one of them one day called me and say, I have a PSA, which is a public service announcement, which means that, you know, you usually don't get paid for that. And said, I can use you. Are you still up for assisting me? And I said, absolutely. I spent three or four days donating my time and... This uh, art director, who himself at the time was an assistant to an art director, became an art director, and then he hired me as his assistant, and we started to work together, and then that's how I broke from the construction part of it into the actual design department, which is either an assistant art director, an art director, or production designer. Eventually, I worked my way into becoming an art director, and then eventually a production designer. So now, was it in your, were you actually aiming for that position when you first started and you first started doing like the, the, the construction? Or was that just something that you kind of fell into? Was that exactly the, the, the place that you wanted to be in film? No, I wanted to end up being the person who was designing things, creating things, uh, visually speaking. Okay. Not physically executing them, meaning building them and constructing them and painting them, but designing them. You know, that was the, uh, the aim and that's what kind of uh, motivated me. So why don't you walk us through a typical day of being a production designer? Well, uh, I think it's, it's not necessarily uh, the day that you have to look at it, but more so the, the development of a project. Um, because a day itself varies greatly from one day to the other when you are in different phases of this project. Let's also understand that there are different mediums that are being used. You have TV commercials, you get TV, you have music videos, you have films, and all of these are very different uh, in terms of um, the progression of the job. So let's talk about what I'm more familiar with, which are uh, TV commercials and feature films. So on a TV commercial, uh, based on the scope and the size of the project, uh, you always have the, the same structure. You have the initial pre-production, which is when you communicate with the agency, the advertising agency, and eventually the client, and you take a concept that they have, and then now you inject your, your own production design into it. So you go back and forth, you submit your designs, you sell your design and your ideas. That is a pre-production part of it with the client. Then you actually have the execution of it, which is you start building it and shopping it. You hire your decorators, you set building companies, and you start putting it all together. And then eventually you have the production part, which is the filming part of it. Now, all of these 
they vary in size and length based on the size of the project. But it is the same concept of pre-production, full production. That is for commercial. When it's on a feature film, it's slightly different even though you have the same concept, which is to, you do the pre-production where you pre-design it, you discuss it with the directors and everybody else, and then you start putting it all together. However, because a feature film is much longer, you have a lot of things that overlap, meaning you have pre-production that happens initially and then you can start into production, which is filming it. But while you're filming it, you are still designing the following sequences. That means that while you're in production, you're also in pre-production for the subsequent sequences that are coming later on in the schedule. So there's a little bit more of leapfrogging in feature film. It does happen to some degree in very large commercials when you have you know, five, six, seven, 10, 12 days commercials. You don't necessarily, you're not necessarily able to do all the pre-production and the design of everything at once prior to starting. Even though you have the general concept and you know what you're going to be doing, the actual execution of the different sequences can overlap on one another, just like they do in feature films. Okay, so basically, what is the um, the time you get to for pre-production for a commercial? Let's assume it's a two-day shoot commercial. Uh, you probably have anywhere between six and ten days worth of prep, what we call preparation, which is prep. Okay, and how about for the feature film? Feature films, uh, it can be months. Oh wow! It, it has it actually has to be months because even though the execution of all of these sequences may overlap. You've kind of pre-designed them, you've discussed them with the director, because once you're in production, uh, it is kind of difficult to, to be able to communicate with your directors and the people that are involved in this decision-making, because it is a collective effort. Um, and then once you know, you're know you filming, you don't really have time. So there is a lot of things that at least the broad stroke are being discussed, and then you put everything in motion prior to. Okay, now how about uh, when you do get a film and you have these different characters, how do you come up with, with the designs of how like their environment is going to look like? Is it something that you have to discuss with producers and directors? Do you discuss it with the cast member, the character itself, themselves, of how they see it? There are many people that are involved. Again, it is kind of a collaborative effort. It's kind of a, a collective conversation. However, they turn to you as being the, you know, the creative or the artistic aspect of it as someone who kind of comes up with your own interpretation. So uh, to put it in very simple terms, when you read a book, you start imagining in your head, oh, this person kind of looks like that and this is his apartment, even though it's not necessarily spelled out exactly that you know his wallpaper is green and his sofa is brown and that the rug is red, your own personal visual interpretation starts formulating something in your own head. This is what we do. So we read the script as production designers and we envision it. Okay. So once we've kind of digested all of that, we talk with the director and say, okay, this is your futuristic, or this guy is this, this guy is, you know, uh, this kind of age, he's married, so you kind of envision what this house is going to look like. And then you inject your own production design into it. For example, you play with tonality, you play with colors, you play with shape. Um, if it's, let's say, a bad guy, you're going to make the environment kind of an austere environment. If it's kind of a, a nice, friendly environment and you want to portray or make the feel of the imagery more inviting, you choose colors that are less aggressive, that are a little bit more inviting. So all of these things are your own personal interpretation. So once you read the script, you say, okay, that environment, I kind of see it like this. This environment, I kind of see it like that. This environment, I kind of see it like that. And the director and, let's say, the producers, because in films, producers uh, often are the ones that came up with 
you know, the script or they were invested into reading a, a book or a script and they have their own kind of interpretation. So they want to hear how you see it. And then that becomes that exchange of opinions. And we narrow it down to something that is supporting the script, but still, you know, visually interesting. And again, I don't, I cannot put a percentage on it, but they, they rely a little bit more on you to actually come up with things that are interesting. Otherwise, they could do it themselves. So, you know, it is your own interpretation, and then you collaboratively find, you know, a medium and a happy medium for everybody to be comfortable with it. Because, for example, I can be a total whack job and tell them, hey, I'm going to paint this one yellow and this one red and this one, you know, with, you know, big pack of dots and someone is going to put the brakes on that and go, dude, you're out of your mind. <laughs> this is not how I saw it. So it's not, it, you don't necessarily have a total carte blanche, you know, but you do have a big say into it because that's what they hired you in the first place. Right. Now let's talk a little bit about your department, talking about a collaboration. Um, who is in who is in your department? Who who are you um, directing or overseeing? And how did they contribute to, to your creation? So as the production designer, you have an art director or multiple art directors, uh, depending on the, the scope of work. For example, if you're shooting in two or three different cities, you need to have people in charge that make sure that things happen. Art directors have a tendency to be more in charge of what I'm going to call the nuts and bolts. Meaning, let's say you're shooting in a certain city and you need to build certain sets and then you go to a certain location and you're going to transform things. Someone needs to supervise that execution of your production design vision. So you have an art director that's in this city and then another art director that's in this other city or another country, depending on where you're shooting. But they follow your visual instruction. So these are your art directors. Usually, as importantly to the art director, especially in feature film, is the set decorator. For example, the set decorator, you tell them, okay, in this house, I want it to be in you know, a family environment, comfortable. These are the type of demographics. These are their ages. You know, this is the kind of the, the life that they have. Now, your decorator takes that information and then starts selecting all of the furnishing, the props and all of that. Um, and then, it, you know, he or she makes it come to life but it has to marry with your vision. So, for example, if it's, you know, it's a family with two children, you know, you, your decorator is not going to bring, you know, black leather sofa and black and white chrome things, you know, because it does not really register as a family environment. So they are pretty important in the final outcome of the, the vision that you had. Okay. So this is your set decorator. Now, we have something that we call the prop master. The prop master in the script, when it goes for, this guy is, you know, opening a book and he's taking his coffee cups. These are props, often because the, the actors are interacting with them. So these are the props, and therefore you have a prop master. Uh, for example, guns. Whenever there's policemen and guns, and this is all a prop master, that thing. So usually it's things that actors interact with. And then after that, within each of these departments, because you have the art director who has his set construction and the scenic guys, meaning the painters, the carpenters that he supervises, you get a fluke of these guys and girls. Uh, then in the decorating department, you have the decorator that we just discussed, who has an assistant or two, he or she has different shoppers because sometimes it's a lot of work and she cannot go and, or he cannot go and find everything. So he surrounds himself with shoppers and then what we call lead men, which are the guys that organize all the pickups and then you have the guys in the trucks and then you have the guys that decorate the set, you have the guys that, you know, move the furniture around. 
uh, some issues of the coding team. And then in your prop department, where you have the prop master that's in charge, he has an assistant or two, he has guys that are, you know, licensed firearm specialists, and none of that. There is other departments after that that are not as relevant uh, but are existing, such as the special effects. Every time you see rain, or every time you see smoke, or any type of mechanical effects, uh, usually you have a special effects coordinator or the person in charge, who based on the type of effects that is required as his own crew, and he does, you know, the smoke and the explosions and all of these things. So you're really heading, you, you are the head of a lot of different departments, actually. Yeah, because at the end of the day, whatever these three or four or five different departments do has a visual impact yeah. on what the, the film is going to look like, and it, it will fall under the creative part that you're supervising. Another department that we've not talked about, on you know, feature film, we call it transportation, but it's all the picture vehicles. Okay. And picture vehicles can play a very key role. Let's say we're, we're doing a period piece of the 70s, and we need to fill the streets with cars from the 70s. Again, these people, they need to have some visual direction, because otherwise they're going to come up with cars that are totally out of the period, that are the wrong color, that are not the right thing. So it's another one of these departments where the production designer says, OK, in that street, I want so many cars, and I want to make sure that the colors are from the 70s, and I need a couple of buses, and I need this, and I need that. You do the same thing with your graphic department. For example, you have storefront windows, and you have signage on the awnings, you have signage on the marquees of the, the theaters or the movie theaters, and you design them to make sure that they look the part. So, yes, you do supervise a lot of things, but it's also the, the amazing part of being a production designer. Wow. And that is a difference between a production designer and an art director. So now, do you actually have someone, do you have an assistant that actually, you know, schedules everything and has everything running smoothly as far as um, communication between all those departments to get it together? Uh, yes and no. It is up to you as a production designer to do that. So you're, you're in charge of scheduling and getting everybody in sync as far as your schedule of how things go? The, the scheduling is a slightly different thing. Um, the communication of what you want creatively and visually speaking is up to you as the production designer. Okay. The actual, again, nuts and bolts, which are, you know, the scheduling of it, you have a coordinator that helps you with that. You know, he or she makes sure that, you know, everybody knows that, you know, we're going to be doing this, I'm going to need to do that. And each department key personnel, a key person in each department is the one on top of, you know, the, uh, the list of the department, such as the art director, the decorator, they all make their own schedule based on, because we all know what we're going to be shooting on what day, so we back into it and we know that before we shoot it, we need to have time to decorate it, we need to, that means we need to shop it, so we all look at the schedule and they all know what they have to do when. So each key person kind of manages their own department. So what do you think, in your job, in your position, what would be the most difficult thing that you have to do as a production designer? I think the, the most, believe it or not, uh, besides being a creative person, um, and we can touch back on the, the creative part of it, but the most important one is your communication skills. And it varies greatly between different individuals. But the bottom line, if you have an idea, you know, a visual concept, if you're not able to accurately communicate it, you're going to have issues. As importantly, within your communication, you need to be able to be, and I hate that word, but it's a, a very accurate word, you need to be a great salesman or saleswoman. Why? Because it does a few things. It validates your ideas because you are able to convey them and convince people. Your conviction is quite important. 
it allows you to have people understand what you're trying to do because if you're vague and you're ambiguous and you're not convincing, people are not going to understand what you're trying to do. They no longer don't be able to visualize it and keep in mind these people that you're trying to convince are not necessarily as visionary as you are. So you need to make sure that you explain yourself to that you describe it as eloquently and as accurately as possible so they see what you have in your own head. And being a salesman also allows you that once you describe what you want, maybe your own power of conviction and passion, they are not going to question you and make you go back to the drawing board. Because you've been able to accurately and convincingly describe what you want to do, they see it, they are satisfied with it. So it does allow you not to have to do more work than you have to. As well as sometimes you have to make your own confessions where you may not have many options available. So if you're not able to convince someone that the option that you believe is the right one, and also potentially the only one that you have, the one to use, then suddenly they're going to say, oh, well, maybe we should try something else. Well, you don't have something else. Or you don't have time to do something else. Or you don't have the money to do something else. So suddenly, you're making your life a lot more difficult. So being a salesperson is very important. Being communicative is very important. If I tell you, or just go and decorate this year, you're going to come back with something that is totally off from what I had in my mind. As opposed to if I describe to you a lot of information, whether it's with visual things that I'm giving you or verbal cue that I'm giving you, then you're going to go in a direction that is very close to what I had in my mind. So communication is important. And as well as the most difficult to do. So then my next question would be, um, we're talking about communication and we talked about how you started out and how someone, you know, pulled you on as an assistant. Who, who would you be looking for as an assistant? First and foremost, let's take it back to what the film industry requires as far as knowledge of what you're going to be doing. Everybody starts at the bottom because you have to start at the bottom to acquire the knowledge of how to do your job efficiently. Yes, you can go to college and film school and spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars. You come out of USC and I put you on the film set, you are worthless. Okay. I hate to say that, you are. Because you don't understand how things work. You've not been exposed to it. So when you start at the bottom, it allows you to know the basics, think of a pyramid. The stronger your knowledge base is, the better your foundation is for you to rise. When I was, when I started to work and on small jobs, I ended up loading the trucks myself. I realized, okay, this is what it takes to load the truck. This is how long it takes. This is how much room it takes in a truck. And then eventually, when I was then an, an assistant art director, I was able to tell my art director, okay, we're doing this here, we're going to do a restaurant, and we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to need so many guys, so many trucks. If I would not have loaded trucks a few times, I would not have realized how much space or how much time or how many guys and how many trucks it takes. So hiring someone is more based initially on Either A, the experience that they already have, or B, and A, but at least B, the attitude and the ability to learn and adapt very quickly. If you're lazy and if you're nonchalant about things, and more likely you're not going to be hired the second or the third time. If you're the person who's always like, okay, I'm done with this here, what else do you want me to do? I can do this, do that, and then ask the question, how would you like me to do this? That person to me is valuable. And because that person on a very simple task is demonstrating that he or she has the, the desire and the, I don't want to say intellect, but at least the 
with the thinking to ask the right, the right questions. He chose me that that person is going to do the task well. If he or she can do that small basic task well, that means that the other task she can do as well because she's going to have the same process of asking the right question, doing it with enthusiasm and speed and efficiency. And then when he or she is done, come and say, what is next? To us, that's what we need. If you're going to be the lazy person over there that's always complaining, that's, you know, more likely you're not going to be hired again. Now, has it ever happened where, let's say, um, you design, you guys put something together, you shoot it, and then you look at the dailies or you, you look back, you know, the that segment, and you're like, oh, no. Like, you, you just completely didn't like it. D- d- has that ever happened where you're like, we need to do it again, or can we do it again, or we need to change something? Has that ever happened with one of your your setups? Um, well, yeah. I mean, things happen where sometimes you're not satisfied. Um, there are different things that what you talk about, for example, you should send me you look in the dailies, and then they go, oh, you know, we don't have this here. In feature films, we have reshoots because it's more because of an editorial thing that's missing where the director realized, oh, you know what, we should have a wide shot or we're missing this or we're missing that. And then we do either additional photography or we do reshoots because we're missing key little storytelling part, editorially speaking. Unless there's something drastically wrong because, you know, uh, the color was wrong. Usually you don't wish it because of that. And especially these days, you can, in what they call telecine or in, in post, you can change things a little bit or you can use another take. You know, there, there are some variables there. So because of that, it rarely happens because of a production design mistake. However, prior to, um, as a designer, you try not to change your mind too many times. Uh, you look at something that you need, you, you visualize it, you think about it, you sit on it, you go back to it, you sit on it, you go back to it again. So once you commit to it, you know that there's no turning back because often you don't have the time or you don't have the financial means for it. But it does happen sometimes that when you deal with some things that are, that are a little bit more complex, uh, then sometimes you have to adapt, you have to change. Uh, or sometimes the director tells you, well, I was going to shoot here, but I'm going to shoot here and over there. So suddenly you got to be up more stuff, you know. And this does happen. Um, I did this uh, commercial for a, uh, a Korean car company, and we built this three tunnels and the car was traveling at speed underneath this tunnel and I made this beautiful uh, light slit so the light was kind of coming through it so you would get that that feeling of travel and that uh, that sense of movement and we were two or three days before shooting at an airport I built these three tunnels and my producer goes um yeah, they like it, but uh, we need the center one to be three times as big. I go, but it's only 100 feet. We talked about doing three tunnels that were 100 feet each. Because, yeah, 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 I know, but we need the one in the middle to be you know, three times as big. And suddenly, in two days, we have to build an additional 200 feet worth of tunnel. Why? Because when they looked at it, they realized, oh, if we want to get the coverage of what we need, we need that much more. So sometimes you have to change things. I did a feature film where I had my um, my cynic. I told them, okay, what, I don't want the white walls. I want that environment to have a certain feel, and I wanted them to, to paint them in a kind of a olive drab green because I wanted to be warm but still not be very inviting. And the color that I chose when we applied it on the walls because there was so many more ambient light and that we had to rely more exclusively on the overhead light and the fluorescent light, that green that looked great on paper or in the sweat, when it was applied on the wall, looked awful. And I had them change it and it still looked awful and I had to change it again. 
it's the only time where I've changed things three times, even though I looked at it and I thought about it and I sat on it and I questioned myself. And But sometimes things need to be changed and you change it. So that it does take some time with those types of scenes uh, to, to constantly get it perfect the way that you want it. Yes. Um, it depends to what degree of perfection or perfectionist you are. Um, but most designers are. Uh, some of us are pretty anal about, you know, we want something and we, you know, it's, it's not that we are egotistical about it, but this is how we envision it. Uh, some because I said, so, you know, I want a green wall that suddenly an apple green would work. No, this is not what I did in mind, you know, I designed it differently. This is what I need. Right. At the end of the day, the, the look of the production design rest on your shoulders. So you have to yes. make sure that you communicate well and then that sometimes even within that communication, you make mistakes. We're all humans, you know. So sometimes you have to adapt a little bit and, you know, you have to change things. Now, in your department and what you do, is there any kind of technologies that have come around that have made it easier for you? Is there anything, you know, computer-wise? or Absolutely. Um, technology... It is great. Um, a lot of the old school guys uh, that are actually afraid of it uh, resent it. Uh, to me, it's the opposite. You have to embrace it. You know, the digital age allows you to do things that we could not do you know, 10 years ago. We have programs that are very simple, like SketchUp, which are actually free that you know your listeners can download from Google because it's, it's a free program and you design things in 3D. There's a huge community of SketchUp artists that create models and things like that. It's very intuitive and I use it personally quite a lot because you know, 10 years ago if I need to draw a set I would draw a certain point of view, it would take me a couple hours to draw it and then the director say, oh, I don't really like this here or the great script for me, that is you. Well, in a 3D program like this here, it's one click, move the mouse, another click, and suddenly I have another illustration. I have saved myself hours and hours of work. It has come down mm. to I, some of the, the commercials that I do in the last couple of years, directors work with me and they create their storyboard from my design in 3D. So we look at mm. my laptop, we're on location in the middle of nowhere, and I show him the different friends, and he starts directing and composing his storyboard from that. So wow. it, it is a great asset. It is extremely advantageous. From that, you can do your construction drawings, your art director, you give him the files, you transform them, you, you know, export them in something else. You can do renderings, you can... You know, you can show different views, you can do visualizations for people. Um, it, it is an extremely advantageous tool. There are some that are a little bit more elaborate, um, but as an art director or someone that's just starting, it's a great tool to have, you know, to show what you have in mind. Do you ever do, um, do you ever do models? The advantage of a model is that it used to allow you to kind of show a 3D world, but in uh -huh. a, obviously in a miniature way. The advantage of SketchUp allows you even more because you can put yourself in that environment at scale, meaning in the scale of it and see what on your laptop, I mean, we have, we have drawings or renderings from SketchUp and you look at what we built and it looks identical. Wow. I've actually, a few years ago, because I, I do enjoy the technological aspect of it, a few years ago I did a, a commercial for Marriott where people were walking into the hotel and as they were walking, everything was changing under them, unfolding almost like origami-like. And what we did, I designed it in SketchUp, a free program. The, the FX company used my design to program 
what they call the motion control, which is a camera that makes the same movement over and over again. And then we built the set, so that meant that when they brought that special camera, we knew exactly where each chair was going to be, each glass was going to be, so when the counter would fold over, the glass was not being cut in half, but it was in the right place. And all of that was because of having the knowledge of that program. Now, if you could change anything in your job and you were the king of Hollywood, is there anything that you would make different? Is there anything that you would change to make it easier or better? In terms of its efficiency, not really. There is a process for things uh, because everybody has a very specific and defined task. It does require quite a lot of people to do what we do because we are specializing in what we do. Mm-hmm. It, would be easy, it would be nice to make it more accessible to other people because it is a little bit difficult to get in the industry. But it's also what's kept the quality of the craftsmen and women in the industry good because there's not an overflow of them. So what would I change? I'm not really sure. It would be great if the budget were bigger uh, because we would get better production value. It would also allow to have a little less stress because you have more time to put things, more money to spend, so the sets would be nicer. You know, unfortunately, everything does cost money, and because it is the, the film business, uh, at the end of the day, it has to be profitable, so they cut corner wherever they can. That's probably what I would change. I guess, and that would give you a little bit more freedom to make um, different choices on how you want to do things as well. Yeah, which can be a cutthroat because you don't want to give people too many choices or too many opportunities of choices. Um, to me, I need someone who has the, um, the ability uh, to be able to make a decision and stick with it because it is an educated choice that they've made as opposed to a, you know, oh, yeah, maybe we can try that, or maybe if that doesn't work, maybe we can try that. You know, to me, that's total lack of uh, commitment or be able to be efficient in your commitment. And you need to have enough self-confidence in your choices uh, to, to me, you know, having the, the power of you know, your own conviction is is important uh, because that shows me that you've thought about it, you've debated it within your own self and you're making that choice because you know it's the right thing. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time and and speaking with us. You're very welcome. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. That's it for Crew Call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the top of website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. Thanks again to Vincent for telling us about all of the many, many responsibilities a production designer has. Tune in next week for another great guest. 